Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today once again is Dr. Christopher Howard, Neuro Hour Brain Guy, and we're talking about exercise and brain health today. This is such an important topic that he brought in his own guest. So with us also is Austin. Austin, I'm going to have you introduce yourself to everybody because I didn't ask you what you do other than work out kind of sort of online with Christopher. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Austin Winston, um, reside in, in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm a, a fitness and performance coach, uh, for a gym here in Indy called Lift Lab. Uh, work with clients of various different ages, um, athletic abilities, uh, training age. Um, been doing that for a while now. I also, uh, full time work as a customer success manager in, in marketing and sales as well. So, a little bit of a couple things. And I know you have at least one teenager. I do have one 15 year old son. He'll be 16 next month. So, you can imagine all the terrifying things that come with turning 16. So, I've got that to look forward to. I don't have to imagine my daughter will actually be 30 in November, which is like, holy crap. I don't oh. know how that happened, but I still remember <laughs> teaching her how to drive and all those exciting yeah. things. <laughs> and yes. now my niece is almost 16. So it's like, Oh boy, round two. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Scary things times. Are, yes. Well, we usually get through it. <laughs> it'll be good for you. It'll, it'll, t- it'll have, you'll have stories to tell. Oh, for sure. So. We are talking about why exercise is good for our brains. Who wants to jump on that one first? Is that a Chris or an Austin starting point? Sounds like Austin starting point. Okay, go for it, Austin. <laughs> so I'll just kind of you know skim across the the uh, the surface level benefits because obviously I'm going to bow to you guys on on the true deeper like cognitive benefits. But um, as far as like you know mental health uh, attached to exercise, I mean the 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 benefits are are pretty resounding. I mean you've got, I mean let's just start at the at the beginning. You, you're creating a regiment, you're creating a routine stability. You know especially for for people with Alzheimer's, like you alluded to, you know, that's going to create a routine, something that they can wake up and get used to every single day they can look forward to. Um, you know, the side effects uh, of completing some type of physical activity are always rewarding. You know, there's that cliche, the only workout you regret is the one you didn't do. So, um, you know, setting your mind to a task and then completing it, you know, however short, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, um, it's going to feel rewarding. It's going to feel like you you achieve something. And then, you know, if we're talking specifically older populations, I think the biggest benefit is confidence. You know, like you, you know, a- as people age, they lose confidence in their physical abilities and then their their quality of life deteriorates. You know, they, they may not want to go on longer walks or they may not want to go up that flight of stairs or they might want not want to do that thing that they, they've always enjoyed doing because they're fearful of a fall or, or not being able to get through it. Uh, exercise and strength training specifically gives you that confidence physically to be able to continue to do those tasks for a long time. I can tell you why I got into strength training because kind of typical lack of knowledge, that typical female attitude, like, oh, I don't want to get all bulky, which just for reference is not possible for women unless you take enhancements. (laughs) And I don't do those. So I don't have to worry about getting bulky from muscle by any stretch of the imagination. But about 10 or so years ago, when my personal trainer, who was 14 years older than myself, said, you know, if you lift weights and put on muscle, you burn more calories sitting on your butt. And I'm like, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) That's all I needed to hear. (laughs) You can see where my priorities lie. (laughs) Right. But it's, it's actually been really like when you said confidence, I'm kind of shaking my head saying, yeah, because my previous career that I quasi retired from last year during the pandemic was photography and I'd have to move around heavy backgrounds. And occasionally the male clients would want to help. And I had to resist not getting irritated because it's like, I can do it myself. (laughs) But I realized they were trying to be polite and and generous. So I just, I allowed them, but it was always kind of interesting when they did not realize that what I was carting around was as heavy as it was. So it was kind of a little internal ego boost when my strength was more than plenty and they were a little surprised, but 
that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them to buzz off. You, you got it covered. <laughs> well, sometimes like I would carry like the light stand, the light, the camera, the cord, you know, like three or four things. And of course they'd want to help because I look like a wreck about to happen. And I just told them I've been doing this so long. I'm a really good pack mule. And it was nice to be able to physically actually do it. And I learned how to like tuck things under my arms and on top of hips so that I could carry everything from point A to point B, which was never very far. And, you know, not drop things because some of that stuff wasn't cheap. And it was almost easier because I was familiar with like the lights on the stands are completely top heavy. And sometimes if the, the light box is on them, it's also a great uh, sail when the wind hits it. So it's like, I'll just handle it because these things kind of have a mind of their own. And I'm really used to just hauling everything. Like, literally, I did look like a pack mule. So Christopher, Austin, yes. Austin touched on why exercise is good for us, mostly confidence, et cetera. Why is it good for our brains? Yeah, yeah you know, what? Austin made an excellent point, though. And it's just something to think about, right? We can look at it from two perspectives. First is a psychological perspective. And one of the things that we really want to look at is just like the quality of life, right? And a lot of times we think about quality of life, we think about maybe sometimes when people are younger or we just think about, you know, just being stressed and we're middle-aged, but sometimes we don't think about quality of life as older adults. And one of the good things about exercise, just from a psychological standpoint, is that it just releases like serotonin and dopamine, like the feel-good hormones, right? And it's one of those things where if you feel good doing something, you're more inclined to keep doing it. It's um, subtle, but carries a lot of weight. So if you feel comfortable working out, if you feel comfortable exercising, it's not something that you want to stray away from, but it's going to be something that you look forward to. And one of the good things, kind of like Austin mentioned, or that he'll probably will mention, is that when you exercise, you just kind of strengthen the cardiovascular system, you strengthen the bones. And there's so many components to it that allows you to live like a little bit more independently. And as we get older, like I think independence is something that we all appreciate because, and, and I know we talk about caregiving. And one of the things is, is like when we start to lose the autonomous living, then that means we have to find other people to help us live. But if we can live independent, not even just live independent longer, but live, what, no, <laughs> if I can say it correctly, but if we could live a great quality of life independently, then that makes a world of difference. Um, also, one of the good things about exercise is that it's good for neuroplasticity. So a lot of research for a long point in time was just going to say, well, neuroplasticity probably ends around 22, 23, 24 years of age. But what we're understanding now is that neuroplasticity goes into late life or late adulthood. And essentially what neuroplasticity means is that it just gives us an opportunity to continue learning. Like it just gives us a chance to show that the brain can still work, that it can heal, that whatever the case may be. And so one of the genesis of neuroplasticity, even in late age, is exercise. And additionally, what ends up happening is that you increase gray matter. The reason why gray matter is so important is because it's the thing that allows us to have muscle control, it allows us to have sensory perception, hearing, smelling, and also it allows us to have memory. So you'll find like a lot of gray matter on the hippocampi. So the hippocampi is part of the brain that allows us to remember. And when we exercise, we um, develop more brain-derived neurotropic factors. These are the things that encourage learning. These are the things that keep the brain healthy. But when we don't exercise or we're under a lot of stress or, you know, we use alcohol, drugs, whatever the case may be, there's, you know, there's a cessation of the development of brain-derived neurotropic factors. And this is when you start to see the memory impairments. That makes sense. So there was one thing I was going to mention and it's trying to slip my mind because it's, it's later for you guys than it is for me, but this is, it's only Tuesday. It's been a bonkers week already. <laughs> oh, it has. <laughs> That's what Christopher was saying. Um, we'll just move on because that brain cell does not want to come back to life. It will in a minute, <laughs> but right now it's just, it's, it's teasing with me. So one of the things, ah, uh, see, I knew it would come back. <laughs> Just had to stop forcing it. For those regular listeners who have heard the episode on frailty, building keeping muscle tone is important to not becoming 
a typical, like in my case, frail old lady, one that walks slower, walks hunched over, you know, is hesitant to do things for fear of falling or becoming injured. So that's another really good reason, you know, Christopher alluded to, it helps you live better, longer, independently. So if that's, if that's your goal, you want to live in your home forever, you want to live as long as, like, I don't know if Austin knows this, but my paternal grandmother lived to be 103 and it was only the last year of, well, she needed, she needed people to help Kate take care of her because she couldn't see. So that was, it was, there was nothing wrong with her mind. It just, she was mostly blind, but she was, her mind was great until the last few months. And then she started having, I believe she started having strokes, but by the time you get to 103, you know, I figure like you've done really good. So that's my goal. Like I'm middle-aged at 54. I got another 50 years to go. That's my theory. So how can exercise help actual caregivers? We talked about reducing stress. Christopher, how does exercise also help pre prevent dementia, which you kind of touched on a little bit already, but let's kind of dive in a little bit deeper. You said it helps expand gray matter, which is where we store memories. Yeah. This yeah, gray matter is like you're going to find it like in the hippocampi. And the hippocampi is a part of the brain that really just kind of works just like memory. And what ends up happening is just that you have these proteins, the brain-derived nootropic factors. And when somebody's in a lot of stress or if they don't exercise, what ends up happening is that those proteins aren't made the same way that they would normally be. And what ends up happening is that this is when you start to have your memory deficit. Like you ever been like super duper stressed and it's like, why can I remember something or why can I function as well cognitively? Well, this is kind of it. So one of the things about exercising is that it just kind of strengthens your system. So you can kind of like work through that a little bit better. And I know I always harp on stress. So I'm not going to belabor the point, but one of the things to kind of think about is that stress just ravages the body. Like stress, like really punishes the body. And one of the things about when somebody's super stressed, the body becomes hypertensive. Just from like the Stone Age day, the body's trying to protect itself because it thinks that something's going to bite its arm and the body doesn't <laughs> get out or whatever the case may be. So when the body's in a lot of stress, it becomes hypertensive. I don't want to bleed out, but we're living in 2021. And what ends up happening is that people just become hypertensive or people have a higher proclivity of developing like um, diabetes because the body's like, I don't want to use energy, like kind of like get rid of the sugar that's in the body. So what ends up happening is the body becomes insulin resistant. And when the body becomes insulin resistant, what we find is like the brain finds like level of atrophy because it's not processing the sugars. Like you need energy to work and stuff like that. So even if you're under, I say all that to say, and you can kind of go a little bit further, the body becomes immunosuppressed Whatever the case may be, when you exercise, uh, exercising is kind of like a panacea to kind of help these things. Like, I can't get rid of my stressful job or can't necessarily, like, remove the stress out of my life. But now I have an extra tool in my belt because I get cardiovascular um, help, you know. So that that kind of helps. Plus, um, one last thing, it's like when you exercise and stuff, what ends up happening is that you have a brain angiogenesis. Or essentially, you just get more blood vessels, stronger blood vessels in the brain. And what ends up happening is that the body can get more oxygen to the brain. So that way, you kind of have a little bit more energy. Because what ends up happening is that, like, let's say you're a heavy smoker, you may have carbon dioxide. And so what ends up happening is that you have, like, a level of uh, being lethargic. But because you get more oxygen to the brain when you exercise, it just creates better cognition. And that's why it's so important. Makes sense. Do you have anything to toss in there, Austin? Yeah. So Chris kind of touched on this a little bit, and this is kind of more what we talk about with some of more of our intense training. So when you're training, you're, you're bouncing in between from, from going from daily everyday life into, into more intense training and, and physical activity, you're bouncing in between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So if you go back to like stress management, that's where that like fight or flight syndrome that Chris was talking about comes in. So when we're training, all stress goes into the same bucket, unfortunately. So stress from training, stress from physical activity is the same. Um, it, it's essentially the same as, you know, stress from work, stress from a loss of a loved one, that type of thing. How your body adapts to it and responds to it is really where the stimulus comes from or where the adaptation comes from. But I say all that to say, 
we want to be able to like if you're if you're able to introduce your body into that parasympathetic state or i'm sorry the sympathetic nervous system when you're in that heightened sense and then be able to get out of it through you know cool downs breathing recovery that sort of thing and you do that over time with a you know a strength training routine then you're teaching your body essentially how to deal with stress in a good way that's really interesting because i before we were recording i was telling austin i finished a power strength program which is basically just it's a weight was a weight training program to help build your strength. And they were it was always a 10 minute stretch after every session. And he talked about going from the parasympathetic to the sympathetic, which I didn't understand as well as I do after what you just said. So that's really interesting that we're basically training our body how to deal with stress. I like yeah. that. An, an easy way to know is because there's a lot of like cool down techniques and breathing techniques and, you know, uh, you know, decreasing your heart rate. Um, but like if you, if you ever get done with a really intense workout and you can't stop sweating for another 10, 15, 20 minutes, you know, you, you haven't, you haven't turned that switch off essentially. So, um, and then, you know, know. you, you want to be out of that, you know, sympathetic system as soon as possible. Cause that kick starts the recovery process. And doesn't the, well, obviously a good intense exercise also helps burn the sugars that we shouldn't be eating, but some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could. If we're going to go nutrition, we could. We could probably do a whole other podcast on nutrition. But oh, <laughs> we might have to do that one. Uh, <laughs> this our ne- on our next recording. <laughs> Although it is a challenge to schedule three people at once. All of us are busy, and <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> takes a couple of starts before we get it going. But yeah, I've, I'm trying to remember. Well, when I first started the strength program. I went downstairs and I showered and I was, you know, doing my morning routine and the muscles were shaking. I looked like I was cold. Everything was quivering. I was like, oh, this is a really interesting uh, experience I haven't had in a long time. So I didn't used to stretch as much after my old workout when I was at the gym because, you know, you still had to get in the car and drive all the way home. And now it's like stretch, avoid the dog licking my face and then go downstairs and shower and dress and start my day. So there are... There, the one negative to working out at home is you don't have quite as much of that transition from working out to whatever you're going to do after working out and the rest of right. your day. But the stretching is amazing because I just, I feel so much better. It's like you can do 10 minute super hard cardio hit class and do a 10 minute stretch and you just feel like you've done a whole hour of working out. I just love it. And I don't, I don't know if the st- Stretching is because I'm getting a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean, you're getting into some of that dopamine and serotonin release too that Chris was talking about there. Then you, you know you've already accomplished the task, so you feel good. This is the cool down. This is the end. You get to go home and move on to the next task of your day, so you feel good. You feel accomplished. Well, I know a lot of caregivers have a challenge with getting enough exercise and rest, which is a whole other lengthy podcast that we'll maybe touch on another day also with the food (laughs) but either like some people you know because of the pandemic you know and me being in california they're going to a park and working out socially distanced in a group but they're also having to keep an eye on their loved one mostly talking about those of us that are taking care or where i'm not doing taking care of a parent anymore but i was and do you have suggestions for what somebody who is like a 24 hour caregiver could do to help relieve? I mean, care when you're taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's it is 10 times harder than taking care of kids, even teenagers who are learning how to drive. And I almost think you need more exercise to burn off that stress. And of course you have significantly less time. So you have some suggestions on what, caregivers should try i mean obviously you need to try a variety of things until you find the one that's right for you but what would you suggest where should they start yeah that's a good question so for for general population clients you know people who are in the workforce and and somebody in that type of field specifically um you know i'm i'm partial to barbell training um really big fan of of you know good old-fashioned you know barbell strength training but I, I'm never going to knock any other form of, of exercise. I think something is always going to be better than nothing. So one, 
find something that you enjoy doing, that it can actually be a, a relief to your everyday life. Um, it, it shouldn't be another obligation to you, you know, for, for too long, I, I think, and, and still to this day, too many people view exercise as punishment, um, whether that be they ate something bad or they've got to go do this for, you know, some reason um, that they party too hard on the weekend, you know, whatever. It, it should be something that you look forward to. Um, so, you know, yeah. And then the, the time constraint, um, you know, it's, you know, like your, your Peloton classes that are 10, 20 minutes, you know, two to three times a week. Like, don't think that that's not enough to create change because it can, um, it absolutely can. So whether that be home workouts, whether that, you know, there's, there's a ton of resources online, I would just say, you know, if you're going to go that route, if you're going to look at to, you know, some of the home videos, um, those type of things, you know, do a little bit of research, make sure you're, you know, you're buying from somebody creditable that has, you know, got some proven success stories of results. Um, and then, yeah, you know, if you've got time to make it into a gym, you know, a, an actual facility, absolutely do that as well. But yeah, time is going to be probably the biggest issue. Just don't set up something, you know, commit a certain block of your day that, you know, Hey, nothing's going to interfere with this. Um, for a long time, I've, I've trained at, you know, 5.30, 6am because I know nothing in my schedule is going to interfere with 5.30 or 6am. I'm thinking barbells might not actually be a horrible option for somebody that has to be home more than not. Not that it's specifically my choice. I've done it. I like dumbbells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it allows you to, you don't want to split your focus too much or else you could hurt yourself, but you're not like clipped into a bike or out of the park or walking the dog, which I also have two golden retrievers, which I did mention the dog licking your face when you're stretching. <laughs> <laughs> and I you know that's not really a horrible choice. It might be a little bit of an investment at first. And I know last year during the pandemic, I don't know if it's improved yet. Dumbbells were impossible to find. So yes, frustrating. <laughs> um, I had we have six, 10, and 15 and 20 pound weights. And I told my husband, I'm like, you skipped the 12s. And he's like, Oh, do you need me to order those? And I'm like, No, I'm kind of getting used to the 15s now. <laughs> <laughs> but now the 10s are getting too light, so I might still have to get the 12s. We'll see. Keep going. Um, but some of the classes that I do, they tell you to use like one, two, or three pounds, and it's like three pounds is pretty light for me. But when you do lots of reps, three pounds is, feels like 30. So it's, there's a lot of options and you don't actually have to buy dumbbells. You can use soup cans and all that crazy stuff. But that kind of leads me into, again, before we were recording, I was talking about this class that I just completed, or this course I just completed. And part of the warm up was actually a balance routine. And it did fire up your body because you had to think, but I learned that, you know, as we age, we lose balance and I'm not entirely certain if that's because we lose muscle tone or it's just a function of aging. So maybe, I don't know which one of you two wants to tackle. Why do we lose balance as we age? They're both staring uh, at me. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go surface level and I'm sure Chris can probably dive into this way deeper. Perfect. Um, so with, with age comes, you know, atrophy, muscle loss. Um, you know, that, that age old saying that we've heard forever, if you don't move it, you lose it. That's, that's kind of true to a certain extent. Um, and, and with decrease in muscle, um, you, again, it, it's, it's a, some form and, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong on this. There's probably some form of like conscious, uh, lack of confidence, right? Like your body knows, you know, I probably can't handle the things or, or, you know, the steps or carrying these, this many bags of groceries up a flight of stairs as I, as I used to be able to, um, as far as what you can do and kind of how I approach, you know, you know, programming and, and training for, for older adults, it there's, there's five pillars of movement that I kind of base all strength training around and it's push, pull, squat, hinge, carry. And then if you want to get, uh, add an extra one in there, rotate. So push is going to be any type of upper body push pull is going to be any upper type of, uh, upper body type of pull. So rows, um, uh, squat, obviously squat. And, and the big thing for kind of balance and confidence, you're going to go remember to train both bilaterally and unilaterally. So not just squatting with your feet together in the same stance, you know, splitting those stance. Uh, I like to say life happens one, one leg at a time. Uh, so make sure we're training that way too. 
Um, big, big believer in bilateral training. Um, I think that can help a ton with proprioception and, and, and balance and, you know, again, confidence as you get older. Um, and then, and then hinge. So picking things up from the ground, you know, pulling from the ground, sending your hips back with a soft knee, a lot of variations we can do there. Carrying things pretty self-explanatory. I don't know if you guys have ever done like farmer's carries or suitcase carries where you just got to wait in one hand. Uh, so what you're doing there is you're resisting rotation, you're resisting pulling by having one a, an offset weight in one hand. That's going to help a lot with, again, the, the grocery scenario. Um, and then rotating, you know, the, a lot of that's based around the core, core strength, uh, not only being able to rotate your body, but being able to resist rotation, to be able to resist external forces trying to act on your body. You know, something happens, a wind, something knocks over. I know a lot of older populations, you know, falls are a scary thing and a lot of damaging things can happen. Um, so yeah, your rotation, anti-rotation is big too. I don't know if I answered that question directly. I kind of went off on, uh, that sounded good. Tangent there, but. Yeah. It sounded amazing. <laughs> good job, bro. <laughs> um, yeah, no, just to kind of piggyback off what Austin was saying, like what, what ends up happening as you get older, like you have like a lot of sensory information, kind of like what I was talking about, like a little bit before when I was talking about like gray matter and stuff and like you want to strengthen your gray matter by way of exercise and you know, what ends up happening is because the gray matter deals with all the sensory stuff and kind of like Wasson was saying with the proprioception is that kind of like when your sensory kind of goes wayward, you know, what else goes wayward is your balance. And this is why it's so important to exercise, not just because you want to like strengthen your core and your, and your muscles and your skeleton and everything, but it's also just to strengthen your senses and stuff like that. So you just don't fall. Or so you will be less inclined to fall and stuff like that, particularly as you get older. Um, so you can have a sense of balance, sense of, you know, smell and hearing and stuff, because, um, I'm not even going to butcher this word, but like sometimes when we get like these viral infections in our ear, you can mess up our equilibrium also. And when you're under a lot of stress and you become immunosuppressant, then you have a higher proclivity of developing some sort of virus or some sort of sickness or whatever, which can also disrupt your equilibrium. So exercise just seems to be kind of like this panacea right like whether you're talking about neural stuff or you're talking about fitness um it kind of just kind of comes back to exercise and exercise is really paramount as people get older and you know not to you know derail the conversation or anything but you know that was something that was really important to me particularly when i was living in chicago was like just really trying to get older people to exercise and be active and stuff because like Austin was saying, like, if you don't use it, you really do lose it. Then you just get to a point of, I don't want to say a point of no return, but it becomes like considerably more challenging to say, okay, I've been exercising 15 years and I've lived like sedimentary lifestyle. And now I got to get back into it because it almost becomes like a formidable process. So it's just finding ways that you can stay active. And it's not about running a triathlon or getting ready for the Olympics or uh, getting ready for the Utah Jazz. Everybody's talking about the Utah Jazz right now, but <laughs> it's about doing something that works in your schedule. I mean, awesome is just really hitting the nail on the head. Um, it's establishing a schedule, saying like maybe from 5 30 to 6 30 a.m. or maybe 8 30 to 9 30, wherever the time is, like this one hour is going to be for me, right? Because if you're a caregiver and you're dealing with somebody else's stuff, the rest of the day, either you're asleep or you're dealing with that person. But if you can like squeeze one hour, hour and a half for you, that's going to pay off dividends. Uh, I remember when I was like a first year student, uh, we were doing a research project. And with the research project, we had people like do a speech, like an impromptu speech. Then when they finished their speech and they didn't know what they were going to talk about. So we just throw a topic at them. We will have them spit on this little vial or whatever. And what will end up happening is that we will look at the cortisol in the viral and in the vial rather, and people who are under a lot of stress and stuff that would have like elevated cortisol. And what we found out with caregivers is like a lot of times with caregivers, particularly caregivers of color, that their cortisol doesn't ebb and flow. Like most people, when they wake up in the morning, their cortisol is like super duper high. This is why you have like a lot of heart attacks in the morning and stuff, because this is when the cortisol is the most elevated. But through the course of the day, it just kind of goes down and just kind of ebbs and flows and stuff like that. But what we found with caregivers, particularly those who are people of color, is that their cortisol just stays stagnant for the entire day. So that means that there's a lot of stress, a lot of hypertensive, a lot of uh, diabetes or a lot of sugar that's not being, you know, rid of by the body and everything of the sort like that. So 
it just comes back to exercise. Same like if you got to go through this, you might as well have your cardiovascular system intact. Whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain. Well, I didn't make it up. I'm trying to remember where I heard that. Heart health is brain health is the phrase. It's popular in my world. <laughs> I actually mentioned that to a friend of ours. He's always had higher blood pressure and been on blood pressure medications. And he started using a CPAP machine and his blood pressure went down. And I said, well, you know, brain health is heart health and heart health is brain health. So it makes sense that, you know, you're getting better sleep. You're getting more oxygen to your brain and your blood pressure went down. I said, I can't exactly explain why it did it. I just, I just know there's a connection and he had never heard that. And he was, he was interested about that. So, you know, it's, it, it works both ways. And I guess I would assume that if you're needing extra oxygen at night because you have sleep apnea, that puts you under stress. And that's, we, we know stress is poisonous for our bodies. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things that it, it does is that it just makes your heart work harder to pump more blood to your brain to get more oxygen, right? Because not, not almost to the extent that you're suffocating and stuff, but like, you wake up groggy, you're out of it, you have cognitive fog and stuff like that. That's just largely because oxygen is not getting to your blood. And when your heart has to work harder, like what ends up happening is that um, the heart's not designed to like be muscular. Like if I do a whole bunch of push-ups and I get like big muscles in my arms or whatever the case may be, but what ends up happening is that like when your heart becomes bulky and stuff, then it can efficiently pump blood and sometimes start getting blood in your lungs. And then you start uh, easing in the uh, congestive heart failure. And, you know, that's something that happens just like with a lot of African-Americans and stuff is that, you know, it's the heart, they have a lot of stress on the heart and stuff like that. And it doesn't bolt well. But if you get more oxygen to your brain, then your heart doesn't have to pump as hard. Um, and it works better for the rest of the body. Long story short. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of balance exercises should uh, caregivers try to incorporate into their almost daily life, like stand at the stove and on one foot and make dinner or, I don't know, that sounds risky to me. <laughs> they don't laugh. So with working from home, I, I built in a standing desk and I spent a lot of my time standing on one foot and, and rotating and standing on another. Uh, part of that time was rehabbing a knee injury too. So yeah, I mean, simple things like that. It doesn't have to be overly complicated though. Like take a bilateral squat and go to a split squat, um, you know, put your hand on a chair, something like that, and just go down and knee goes straight down as low as it can in the, the back knee and then, and then straight back up. Um, you can do that type of stuff around the house. Um, same with hinge patterns. You know, you can, you can split stance a hinge pattern. Uh, I just, you know, not to shamelessly plug, but I just posted a video of my son doing kind of a split stance RDL, uh, which is stands for Romanian deadlift. So you're just, you're, the hips are going straight back but you're splitting your feet. So you're, you're offsetting that load and you're putting the, ma the majority of your weight on one foot. So it doesn't, um, you know, balance training, stability training. It, it doesn't have to be super elaborate um, to, to see benefits. I mean, just get on one leg, be strong and, and balanced on one leg, however you can. And it's okay to have like the countertop, you know, like rest your fingers on it while you're establishing better balance. Cause I know a lot of people shy away from balance exercises because they're afraid that trying to get better balance, they'll fall over and, you know, crack their head or break a leg or a hip or something terrible. And I remember years ago, and I do think I told Christopher this story. I was in a women's service sorority and there was an older gal, not a very positive person. And a friend of hers, typical act of daily living was getting dressed we all do this, stick your leg in like put both legs in one or both. Yeah. Both legs in one pant hole. And the next thing you know, poop, you fall over. Well, <laughs> I don't know exactly what dressing mishap she'd had, but it was her fall was severe and it was severe enough that it scared this other gal into telling all of us that, you know, we should always be seated when we put on our pants, which that's just a pain in the butt. And <laughs> thankfully I was, doing my weight loss journey and there was a geriatric nurse retired that was part of our group and we were both like oh no 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 and we basically said no use it or lose it and that's what i tell people i'm like you can you know stand on one foot if you need to put your hand on the counter to like 
reorient your balance, that's fine because that helps train your brain too. And eventually it'll be easier to stand on one foot without using the counter. And maybe you will stand away from anything that you might fall on or use to balance, but a little aid is not a big deal. It's just, we got to build up the balance and trust me, I have contemplated doing some probably not super smart things. We had a three foot fence in our old yard and there was times I'm like, I should just like balance beam walk across it. Well, it wasn't the most well-constructed fence and there, it probably would have been hazardous to walk across the top of the fence because of the construction. But I'm like, if I fall one way or the other, I'm going to land on the hard ground. So I'm just not going to be stupid. <laughs> so I never did it, but those thoughts did go through my head and I'm like, I'm just getting crazy. You know, now I'm wondering, I'm like, I probably should have tried it, but it's okay. I'll, I'll keep trying to stand on one foot with my eyes closed. I don't understand why closing your eyes makes the whole world tilt and you have to put both feet down the floor. <laughs> it must be the sensory input. Is that right, Christopher? Correct. Okay, cool. So <laughs> we're not exercising. We're taking care of somebody who needs like, every minute of our attention. What do you suggest we do, Austin, to carve out maybe 10 minutes every day for the next month and hopefully we can expand it to 15? What's the what's the most bang for their buck they can get in those 10 minutes besides a hit cardio class that might be a little too intense for somebody who hasn't been exercising for a while? And hit for those people who aren't in our world stands for high intensity interval training. And trust me, it is tough. <laughs> so are we, just so I understand, so the scenario, so this caregiver, is this caregiver living in the home with the patient? No, so when you say 24-hour care, it's in home? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, obviously 10 minutes a day is is not enough time to, to get to a facility. So you're going to have to find useful things around the house. Um, I mean... And this, this is a very broad scope. This was without me, you know, knowing any backstory on this person or, you know, providing an assessment. I, I just will always fall back to those five pillars of movement. Um, and if, if you can get a kettlebell, uh, if you can get a dumbbell, if you can get something that provides some type of external resistance and you can go through some type of variation of those five pillars of movement, that is a great starting point. You don't have to think that I have to, you know, not, not to knock, you know, burning calories because burning calories is a great benefit of exercise, but in 10 minutes, your goal shouldn't be to burn as many calories as possible. Um, you got, there's, there's 23 hours and 50 more minutes left in the day for you to burn plenty of calories just in your day-to-day -day life of being active and walking and taking care of this person and doing other things in those 10 minutes, you shouldn't chase calories. Um, you should chase strength you should chase resiliency and then, you know, build from there. Okay. I can, I, I've been doing 10 minutes, three times a day consistently. Okay. Let's, let's see if we can push it to 15. Let's see if we can push it to 20, you know, and, and, and then continue to go from there because your body does adapt. So the same, the same stimulus that you've been presenting yourself, you know, for that 10 minutes a day in the first month is, is going to get pretty easy, pretty quickly. So you've got to find ways to increase either that resistance or that time that you're spending in that movement or those movement patterns. You've got to continually try to progress that. But again, I still fall back to something's better than nothing. So that's definitely true. You have any suggestions, Christopher? I know that's not your, your area of expertise, but. Um, no, I, I mean, um, I think the biggest thing, and uh, I was talking to some of my young kids earlier today, is establishing a schedule. Like, what do you, what do you want? Like, right, like establishing goals. And because the thing with goals is this: like, you could be doing like a really amazing job, but if you're not working towards something, then you could be doing a good job or a bad job, and it's almost no, no difference because you don't know what you're working towards. So the biggest thing is just establishing goals. Like, what you want to do? Like, what you want to get out of it? I'm going to lower your blood pressure. Um, you want to lower your A1C, um, you want to get more lean. I don't know. Like, you know, it's just about establishing goals and really establishing a schedule. And like, one of the things I always try to teach is having parameters, like having parameters around your schedules, because it's easy for people to impede on what you're trying to do and stuff like that. So just having like, okay, like whatever time I have, this is going to be the time that I get it. And some days are going to be better than others. But like Austin was mentioning, like 
a little bit earlier in the conversation, it's about the confidence of getting something done. Say, hey, you know what? Today wasn't my best workout, but you know what? I did it to an hour. And when I do it again tomorrow, I'm going to be that much better or I'm going to be that much uh, more focused or what can I do to kind of tinker with it to like really get the maximum effort out of it. So it's like small things that go a long way. It makes sense. And two things struck me as you were speaking, setting the goals. If you're taking care of a, lo- of a loved one at home, which is extremely mentally and physically exhausting, and it's just it is not a job for the average person. It's just, it's just so incredibly challenging but it's stressful. And if you say, I'm taking these 10 minutes so that I can keep my stress under control so I don't bark at my mother the 17th time she tells me that freaking story or asks me, you know, I know one caregiver they're dealing with, mom forgets that she's eaten. And apparently I would assume that her brain has lost the ability for the the satiety. You know, it's like it's Her body doesn't know when she's full. So she eats breakfast and turns around and gets angry because she hasn't been given breakfast. And so they have this constant battle with mom is always wanting to eat. So, you know, you need to keep your stress under control because if mom is getting angry because you didn't feed her when you did and you snap at them, all you're doing is making the situation 10 times worse, which none of us want. And then... The, also with the goal setting and you were talking about, well, today might not have been my best workout. It's really nice. And we did when we, Christopher and I recorded an exercise episode, but then we, we put that one on hold for this one. And then the last one, we talked a lot about my expensive exercise toy, also known as a Peloton. And there's a lot of measurements of how fast you're pedaling, what the resistance, so how hard you have to pedal And when I first started, I did not like the speeds they were going at. And now I'm, I can do those speeds on the, you know, turning the pedals and it's showing up in cycling with my friends. They've noticed that I'm stronger. So I'm getting kind of a double benefit of I'm getting stronger and faster and it makes me happy because I can see it, but then I can feel it when I'm actually out on my road bike. So you know, it's just, it's an accomplishment where when you're taking care of somebody, it's one of those things where the job is never done. You never really, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times your accomplishment is I didn't yell at them and I kept them alive. Uh, can, can, I throw, can I throw one more thing in there? And um, one of the things that's like really important for that's often looked over is just like high levels of social connectedness, being around good people. Because not only do like other people can help keep you accountable and stuff, but it's kind of like your support system. Like you had a, a tough day with a loved one who has like a dementia, or whatever. You have somebody that you can reach out to and be like, "Hey, this is what happened," and, stuff. and that's a way of like kind of reducing the stress. Is like just having a, a good support system and somebody that can kind of help you hold it, be accountable. But one thing also is sometimes like when you're dealing with a loved one, I'm probably said this like a, a billion times or whatever the case might be. But what ends up happening is that it's so easy to slide into a dark place. You're frustrated. You're isolated from social resources, monetary resources, emotional resources, spiritual resources, whatever the case may be and stuff like that. And what ends up happening is that you think your world is confined to you and the person that you're taking care of. And then that's when like levels of guilt kind of creep in and stuff because you want to love the person who loved you when you were younger, whatever the case may be. But now you're reaching a breaking point. And this is when like... You know, sometimes you can see elder abuse or sometimes like when bad things happen and stuff like that. So it's important to like really edify social connectedness or social resources because those things are going to help you. Like when you don't feel like going to the gym or you don't feel like exercising, you don't feel like doing push-ups, you don't feel like doing whatever the case may be. You have someone that can just say, hey, you can do it. It's okay. Or we can do it together and stuff like social connectedness is so small, but so impactful. That is very true. I'll, I'll piggyback off that too. The the gym, and, and again, this isn't an option for somebody who only has 10 minutes, but if you do have an hour a day where you can make it into to a facility, a lot of people go to a gym for the community aspect and, oh, and maybe not so much the, the larger big box gyms, but like one thing like, you know, not advocating or not advocating from CrossFit, but CrossFit, one thing that they mastered was community. 
Um, you, you bring people from totally different fitness backgrounds, totally different walks of life, and you bring them together and there's a family culture. So like what Chris said, like, you know, there's somebody to hold you accountable, but there's also somebody like, Hey, if I don't go to the gym today, I'm not just letting myself down. Like, so-and-so is not going to see me. This person's not going to see me, you know, like I got to go see them. And then also it's an outlet. It's not only an outlet through exercises, it's an outlet to maybe vent to those people, you know, for five, 10 minutes after class, this is what I'm going through just for you to have some type of social interaction outside of that, you know, the, what's going on at home. So yeah, community is huge, huge type of fitness. Yeah. You know, so funny, just, I don't, cause I don't think we mentioned this at all, but the way I know Austin, like I've known Austin since my freshman year of high school stuff, because we used to play football together. And it just blossomed into like an amazing friendship, like 20, 21 years strong, right? When did we start? Was it 99,000? Well, it, it just along two it's decades. Been a while. Years. Let's not remember. date us too much. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that, you know, it, it was a friendship that was uh, forced through fire. I mean, we did two days together. Like, I don't think kids do two days like we used to do two days because I think it was maybe like three days or so. But like when we did two days, it was like two weeks. Like, you have to wake up at six. And we would do football from like maybe seven to 11, then like one to four or something like that. You know what I mean? And more than anything, because, you know, football is a violent sport, just hitting and tackling where the case may be. But it's just one of those things like, man, I'm sore, I'm stiff, but I know I'm going to see Austin the other day. Or, you know, I know if we're doing all this conditioning stuff, we're going to get next to each other. And we're going to tell jokes while we're running and stuff like that, which makes it a little bit more pleasant. But more than anything, it's like, okay, we're going to do this together. Like no person left behind. And it's a mentality that's developed that's carried me through the doctor program, the undergrad, through just life in general, stuff like that. It's like having an accountability partner and it's like a mindset that develops. It makes sense. That's the one thing I miss about going to the gym is that social, social life that I had there. What is actually really interesting, and until you experience it, you guys are going to think I'm insane, um, but that is one thing that Peloton has gotten, done, they do really well, is community, considering it's online, and it's not interactive, even if you do the live classes, so you know that you're pedaling with all these other people at the same time and they're all over the country. It doesn't feel any different than the on-demand class. So you could do, you know, the live class Sunday morning and then do it again Wednesday afternoon. And it's the, it does, it's not going to feel different, but you know, it's there and there's, there's some interactive things like giving people high fives on the leaderboard and, you know, they can high five you back. So there's, there's little tools that they've incorporated to kind of help that it's not quite the same that much i can admit because i still do miss talking to the gal that did cat rescue um i cannot tell you how many people i went to the gym with who ended up buying pelotons during the um pandemic and then i've met people i don't know if chris caught it because i'm not sure i responded to a tweet of somebody's with something about the Peloton and somebody else that follows me is like, Oh, I have a Peloton and you can follow each other. So if whenever I'm on, if they jump on, they know, Hey, Jennifer's doing this class. You want to join them? It's, it's really interesting how they've incorporated as much socialization as physically possible or virtually possible is probably a better term, you know, considering you don't actually see the people in real in real life it's just through a screen and the instructors are really good at there's times when you feel like they're talking to you and it's pretty cool it's still not quite the same but it's pretty damn close (laughs) it's better than not going to the gym or doing anything at home and it was better than the youtube videos that we did for Many months until the Peloton came last year. <laughs> it's been an interesting journey. My uh, anti-exercise to I only skip one day a week and I don't always do that either. We walked the dogs every inch of the area around our house last year to the point where it's like, I love you guys, but I oh, my God cannot walk these dogs anymore. <laughs> and it's it's just because it's so boring. You know, I did. I went out the other day because my husband had a medical issue and he's not allowed to walk the dogs right now. And the dogs are like looking at me like, please, mom, please take us out. So I'm like, okay, there's a a little tiny farm stand down the road from it's about a mile and a half from here. 
and she sells flowers. So I had my water bottle, the two leashes, and then I'm carrying this vase of flowers home. It's like crazy, but it had a purpose. So it wasn't quite as bad, but I listened to like a really long podcast during that walk. So when I walk with the hubby, it's just, oh, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> and that, it's and that's we, physical activity too. So that's, you know, that's has its benefits as well. We're trying to get back to our workout routine in the morning and walking the dogs, like just walking, like before his, he had pulmonary embolism, so low, blood clots in his lungs. Before this happened, he literally would walk like two and a half miles in about 40 minutes with the dogs. He's much taller than I am, so that's physically possible. I cannot do that without having to run, and it just kills my knees, the pavement, and ugh, it's not cool. So that was all working fine, but now the poor dogs are like, we ever going for a walk again? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it'll, he's getting better. It just takes time. Get the, get the blood clots out of the system and change the medications. It's, it's a challenge, but it's much nicer to just kind of walk in the evening and not have to like, he's power walking and I'm like chasing him ah, down the street. <laughs> Cause I've told people, pace. yeah, it's like, I've told people if it's between the bear and running away from the bear or getting eaten, I'm lunch, you know, cause I have bone on bone <laughs> issues with both knees and it's just not happening. <laughs> so before we wrap up, because like Austin said, he's in Indiana, so it's getting kind of late. It's dinner time for Chris and I, even though we're an hour apart. Yes, yeah. Do you guys have any last minute advice for caregivers and those of us that want to age well, keep our brains intact so we don't have to have a caregiver? Yeah. Chris, I'll let you go. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, biggest thing, health is wealth. And I think to our set, uh, large extent, it's just a mindset, you know, and I know sometimes it's easier said than done, but just the quest of being active is going to pay off dividends, particularly as people get older and stuff, because it's something that, you know, you become accustomed to something that you enjoy, something that gives you a better quality of life. So you're going to want to maintain it as long as possible. So I think, I think that's a big thing. And just recognizing that whatever happens to your heart, happens to your brain. So it's just important that you take care of your heart because you're going to start seeing these subtle changes that add a lot. And if you can just stay active, you're always going to want to remain active. And um, I don't know, I was trying to think of something unique or special to say, but <laughs> it's different. I throw in these questions without prep. <laughs> so what's your last tidbit, Austin, before I let you go harass the teenager in your life? <laughs> I, uh, I I don't have anything like super witty to say either. I, I will say kind of the the, this hits home for me because, you know, as big as I am into, into strength training and fitness, uh, one of the biggest challenges in my life is getting my own mother to do any sort of like physical training. God, and, yes, you know, we've, <laughs> we've butted heads on it for years. And, and I think now we're to the point where she knows, uh, we just got to put one foot in front of the other, but I think it just basically comes down to, and, and I don't know if it's a generational thing. I don't know if it depends on, you know, what part of the world you grew up in, but it, it's, and there's still a lot of this, uh, that, you know, exercise, physical activity. It's also, it's almost like associated as like, you know, like a, like a fad thing or like, Oh, he, that person's a, a fitness person or that like, and that should just be, everybody should be that, you know, and, and there's going to be different levels of fitness. There's going to be different levels of physical activity and exercise that people do. Um, but it, it should be a part of your everyday life, just like breathing and sleeping and eating. Um, and I think for, you know, kind of, you know, the, the older generation, it's, 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 you know, just finding information, finding credible resources, this podcast, you know, reaching out to people, if they're interested in it, if they truly do know that there are benefits to it, um, just, you know, seek out somebody, ask questions, and, and don't think that just because you're getting older, this is just what you have to accept. You have to accept this way of life. You have to accept being more sedentary, being more active because, because you don't, because there's a lot of people out here that are still very much living life to the fullest, you know, well into their older years. So. So your guys, mom's probably not a lot younger than my mom was. My mom passed away last year at 77. She did not need to exercise regularly to maintain her body weight so thrilled i did not get that gene 
<laughs> uh, super sarcasm for those of you who are not watching the video. <laughs> um, and so she just, I think her generation probably looked at it as you need to exercise to lose weight or tone up. And if you didn't think you needed to do either of those two things, then you didn't need to exercise. So what's your struggle with your mom, Chris? You said when, when Austin said <laughs> he was working on his mom, you were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, and COVID didn't do any favors and stuff. Cause I remember I was just like, mom, just, I mean, cause Austin's been to my house at my parents' home and I mean, it's a really nice neighborhood. I was just like, mom, just walk to the bridge and back, you know, and she was like, well, someone might be jogging and they breathe on me and I get COVID. I was like, I don't, I don't think it works like that. Um, but, um, <laughs> this is developing a routine and it's just like, mom, like you got like one of these stationary bikes and stuff that she had, like, some guy who was supposed to work in a house and stuff moved into the living room. I'm just like, mom, all you need is 30 minutes. Like, if you wake up 30 minutes, get on a bike, you have the rest of the day. But what ends up happening is that you don't really do exercise, per se. And when you go to the grocery store, you don't walk to the grocery store. You, you know, find handicapped parking and you just kind of like just go in and stuff like that. And just like, you got to get to the point where you're not afraid to sweat or that you're not afraid to exercise because you sleep better. You eat better foods and stuff like that. But if you don't exercise, it's just kind of like, okay, you don't go to bed at like maybe two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Then you sleep half the day away. Then you just do the same cycle. And it's just like, you got to get the heart strong, particularly as you get older and stuff like that. Um, and that's just the biggest thing is just trying to preach like you got to do it. You got to do it. But see, I guess it's a little bit different because I've been doing sports since I was like three, four years old and stuff. So it's nothing to go to the gym or go for a long bike ride or go for a walk or whatever the case may be. Where with her, she's never really done physical activities per se. So it becomes that formidable challenge that we we're talking about a little bit earlier of saying, okay, I'm going to wake up at 6.30. I'm going to wake up at 7. And I'm going to be on a stationary bike for 30 minutes. And then I'm going to eat this type of breakfast. And then when I go grocery shopping, wherever the case may be, I'm going to park further away and just find any avenue to get exercise. I'm working on her, but she's not doing it. <laughs> it's a process. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> I did not take that on that challenge with my mom. But by the time I learned how important exercise was for aging well, it was too late for her mind anyway. So... That's just just the way life works. She always said everything works out for a reason. I'm still wondering why Alzheimer's was the reason for her, but I guess I'm going to have to wait another 50 years to find that one out. <laughs> That's my plan. <laughs> well, I really appreciate both of you guys jumping on and talking about exercise. I've talked about this before. I'm sure we're going to talk about it again. Like I said, Christopher's got, we recorded an episode, I don't know, a month or so ago. And so it's, it's in the holding tank, basically, for, I don't know, sometime in 2022, maybe, when Christopher's so busy, he can't do his his monthly neuro hour, power hour. There we go. I should be able to say it, except that the in my screen, that, that logo is backwards, so <laughs> it takes me a second. And I wish um, you and your family well, Austin, and hopefully, you know, things are starting to open up. This is still June when we're recording. This is coming out like right after Labor Day. I'm going on a three-week road trip, so I'm getting way ahead of myself here. So maybe one of these days we can all get together. And Austin can show me how using um, a board, a slant board, I think you said, to do better lifting with crappy knees. Yes, yes, we can, we can, we can do that. Get some uh, cyclist squats for the cyclists. Ah, uh, yes, that's what you called them. Yeah. I'll just have to build a little board thingy for my house <laughs> that the dog doesn't <laughs> knock me off of. <laughs> just elevate the heels. That's all you got to do. I should be able to find something around here that'll work for that. I will I will give that a try. Hopefully the, well, it, well, by then my husband will be walking the dogs again in the morning and it'll be safe. I don't have to worry about them. And one of these <laughs> days, Christopher and I are going to either ride in Napa or someplace pretty in Utah. I look forward to it. I can't wait. Nice. You would love riding your bike in Napa. Lots of nice trails, lots of good food when you're done. Wine, if that's your thing. It's not my thing. I like sugar, so I, I just drink water and tea. Yeah, well, One of these days, I, we'll all get together on something other than a flat screen. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I Absolutely. appreciate this, and I will talk to you guys again soon. Take care. Thanks for having me. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.